Hello and welcome to uh, the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty's presentation on uh, the question of criminalization and um, and how you can present it in your continuum of care applications. Um, my name is Eric Tars. I'm a senior attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, and we serve as the legal arm of the nationwide movement to end and present, prevent homelessness. We're here today because HUD in its funding application um, that was released last month uh, told communities for the first time that prevention and reduction of criminalization of homelessness is worth up to two points on their applications. Continuums need to be able to respond truthfully in that question and we'd like to give you some of the tools for doing so. Because the truth is there are limited dollars for homelessness and money wasted on criminalization is money taken away from you and criminalization is unfortunately growing. You may or may not have strong opinions on the subject of criminalization, but by asking the question, HUD has given you the political cover to bring these issues to your decision makers and push them to make policy that can be more successful in decreasing homelessness. And as HUD Secretary Ann Oliva, uh, Deputy Secretary Ann Oliva stated in a recent article, the competition is fierce, so what we'll talk today uh, about today matters for your community. So we've uh, brought some leading experts here to help share with you the basics about criminalization and what can be done about it. Again, I'm Eric Tars, Senior Attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, and because we believe the discussion about homelessness must be led by those with direct experience, I'll ask Rob Robinson, a member of the New York City Coalition on the Continuum of Care, and a formerly homeless person himself to talk about what criminalization looks like from the directly affected victim's perspective. Then I'll talk a little bit about how criminalization manifests itself and provides a national perspective. And then I'll ask Liz Osborne with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness to share what the federal government is doing about criminalization, including activity at the U.S. Interagency Council, HUD, the Department of Justice, and to speak specifically to the question on the continuum of care funding application with some resources that they have to share. Then I'll ask Barbara and jo Khalil and John Freitas, um, who are members of a continuum of care in Rhode Island, to share some thoughts on how to approach this from a COC perspective. Um, and I'll ask Rob to follow up with wearing his hat as a continuum of care member to talk about New York City's application process. And then finally, I'll close with some recommendations on what can and should be done. This is a huge webinar, so we can't open up the audio to questions, but you can type questions into the chat box on the side of your webinar viewer, and we will do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation, um, or uh, if necessary, we'll take them back and answer them afterwards. But first, before we get going, let's find out a little bit about who we are on the webinar and what we know. So first, are you part of a continuum of care? Just click the answer on your screen. Great, looks like got a lot of people from Continuums on. Um, about 60% and 25% uh, who aren't, and then some others who aren't sure. And who are folks out there? Are you advocates, government officials, service providers, legal providers? Great. So a very good mix of advocates, service providers, some government officials, and other and legal providers. And last but not least, what's your level of knowledge of criminalization and constructive alternatives?
So, uh, again, a good mix. Uh, some folks are very expert, uh, a lot who are have some knowledge but are more, learning more, and then a few who don't know much at all. So we will try and speak to all of these audiences today, and hopefully everyone will be able to learn something. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Rob to talk um, uh, as a formerly homeless person about what criminalization of homelessness looks like from the ground and, and why this is so important for us to be talking about today. So thank you, Eric, and thank you, everybody who joined the call. And a, a big thank you to the National Law Center overall, who has been bringing directly impacted folks like myself into discussions that in the past we have been sort of pushed away from. So I appreciate all the work that the Law Center has done around this. Appreciate the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness and the Department of Justice for opening up and listening to folks like myself who were directly impacted. And then finally, as advocates like myself often point at the finger at the federal government, I'll say on this phone call that HUD has taken the lead amongst the government agencies to reverse this disturbing trend. So there's a lot of appreciation and thanks. Um, I'd also like to hope that many of my colleagues from the New York City Coalition for the Continuum of Care are listening. And if you are, a big shout out to you all. Finally, a sincere uh, gratitude is owed to those who are directly affected by this issue of criminalization, who rose up to share their stories and doing so against uh, direct uh, oppression by several forces. So those folks who shared their stories, I think that's a very important process. As Eric said, my name is Rob Robinson, and I'm based in New York City and a staff volunteer at a human rights organization called the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative. That's in addition to my work on the continuum of care. So a lot of the work I do is around economic, social, and cultural rights. And the work that I do goes back with Eric a long way into some international stuff, which I won't get into, but I say some of that international advocacy has played into some of these outcomes that we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm formerly homeless, having spent two years on the streets of Miami and 10 months in the New York City homeless shelter between 2004 and 2007. Um, at the end of my stay in the shelter, that, the director of that organization, which is Urban Pathways in New York, a gentleman by the name of Fred Schack, after I was advocating while I was in that shelter against them, thought it was a good idea for me to go to a continuum of care meeting. And I've been attending those meetings since 2008 when I was elected as a voting member to the steering committee of the continuum of care. And this past September 18th, I was elected to an eighth consecutive term on that committee. So I'm kind of honored to be representing New York uh, for a number of years around these issues. Um, September 18th was also a historic day for me personally, and I believe for many homeless and formerly homeless individuals around the country. As I was sitting in our monthly New York City continuum of care, I received an email from Eric informing us that HUD had taken that huge step towards ending criminalization of the homeless. It meant those voices of the people directly affected were not only being heard, but being validated. Um, our New York City continuum is one of the largest continuum in the country, and we monitor over $100 million in McKinney-Vento McKinney funding through over 200 care providers serving chronically homeless populations. The funding is directed to shelter plus care, and we can go into more about what that is later. I think most folks should on this call be familiar with what that is. If you don't, you can certainly ask a question, and we'll be more than happy to answer. Homeless folks have complained for several years about treating uh, how they're treated, particularly in public spaces. Individuals sleeping in parks will often be targeted by police for urinating in public, drinking in public, and even in some cities sleeping in public. In New York City, these offenses often lead to violations. Those violations can add up to misdemeanors, and several misdemeanors in some cities and localities can lead to felonies. Finding housing for folks that have uh, felony records can be a challenge for care providers with the best of intentions. We know less, low threshold entry points like public housing can be inaccessible for those in these situations. Many housing authorities around the country will automatically turn folks away with criminal histories. The statistical data proves time and time again that permanent housing is a more cost-effective model and option over incarceration. It is also the solution to homelessness. People are homeless because they don't have a home, so permanent housing is the solution. It's certainly not a jail cell. On August 6th, the DOJ's Civil Rights Division filed a strongly worded statement of interest in the case of Janet Bell of Boise, Idaho, 
if a person uh, has really nowhere else to go, and the enforcement of anti-camping ordinances against a person criminalizes him or her for being homeless, uh, it's a problem. It affirmed a long-held law center position that the brief concludes that criminalizing homelessness is both unconstitutional and a misguided public policy and constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. This echoes recommendations we have garnered from international human rights monitors over the past few years. Um, I talked about international advocacy that we've done. And I think it's a huge step by the federal government of implementing some of those obligations based on international human rights law. Um, on the Pacific Coast, there are strong efforts to reverse the trend of criminalization being led by organizations and advocates with the support of the Law Center and Law Schools. The Los Angeles Community Action Network, or LA CAN, Right to Survive, which is a tent city in Portland. Sisters of the Road in Portland have all launched efforts uh, to pass homeless bills of rights. And in fact, they are all in a coalition called the Western Regional Advocacy Project, of which a good friend of mine, uh, Paul Bowden, a formerly homeless individual, is the director of organizing, and is often quoted by national publications on these issues of organization. I want to also take the time to recognize organizations like the National Coalition for the Homeless in D.C. and picture the homeless in New York City where I got my start as leading the charge against this issue of the criminalization of homelessness. So quickly, um, just some introductory stuff on the NOFA and then I'll turn it back over to Eric. Um, every two years, HUD issues that notice of funding availability, um, which we call the NOFA, to local continua. Um, there is about uh, two billion dollars in funds available, um, but for the first time, HUD is asking continuums to describe how they are reducing the criminalization of the homeless. So I think this is an important first step in reversing this trend, and I want to be clear here to the care providers on the phone. This is not a target against care providers. I think what HUD is saying is that continuum around the country have to work in collaborations with with justice officials, legal communities, with police departments to reverse the trends. It's, it's, I, I, I like to say the model that the interagency council put together, government agencies coming together and working on this issue, I often challenge New York City government to do. It's a model that needs to be replicated because that's how you find true solutions. So, At this point, I'm going to stop here because we have other speakers that have other information. I know there are a bunch of questions. So, Again, I want to thank the Law Center for the opportunity and thank you join the call. Thanks so much, Rob. I really appreciate your bringing uh, all of your perspective uh, to the issue and um, and uh, highlighting many many of the points that we'll talk about in more depth uh, throughout the presentation today. Um, so uh, with that, I will now talk a little bit more about uh, what these laws look like, about how the costs that they impose on communities um, also influence the, the costs on individuals, and finally about some constructive alternatives. Um, so we know what causes homelessness. The lack of affordable housing is the primary cause of homelessness across our country, um, and as well as the inadequate mental health care systems uh, and inadequate substance abuse um, access across the country. So the question is, why would we make a criminal justice response to a social issue problem? In the vast majority of cities across the country, there are far more homeless people than even shelter beds, let alone permanent adequate housing options. So laws that make it illegal to perform basic human life behaviors like sleeping, sitting, or eating in public when people have no private alternative literally makes it illegal to exist as a human being in these towns. The Law Center conducts a survey of 187 cities across the country every few years and we found many of these laws exist in cities big and small. Cities have found creative ways to criminalize homelessness, forbidding everything from sleeping in cars to even sharing food with homeless people. And these numbers are growing. Between 2011 and 2013, there was a huge growth in cities imposing citywide bans on camping, loitering, and begging. We believe these numbers came as the additional resources from the stimulus left communities and the sequester caps were instead imposed, but that the recovery that has come to Wall Street has not yet come to Main Street. So homelessness has become more visible 
while fewer resources are available to deal with it, resulting in an increased push to do something to sweep the problem out of public view. To focus in a bit, we've seen a particularly big growth in citywide bans on camping, although as Oregon Federal District Judge Michael McShane said at the 2015 University of Oregon Law School graduation, it's not camping when you're homeless. Nonetheless, cities are harassing those who try to shelter themselves, creating whole zones where people simply uh, can't exist if they have no roof over their heads. It's one of, the law, one of these laws that we challenged in our litigation in Boise that Rob mentioned earlier, which many of you may have heard about uh, when the Federal Department of Justice filed its brief in our case, agreeing with our position that to enforce such a ban in the absence of alternatives constitutes cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment of our Constitution. In addition uh, to the attention from the Department of Justice, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness has recently introduced guidance on how communities can deal in a more positive way with encampments, um, and Liz will talk a little bit more about that later. There's been a similar growth in laws banning begging, both blanket citywide bans and in particular uh, usually downtown or touristy places. However, the Seventh Circuit recently handed down a decision in another of our cases that draws on new Supreme Court precedent to say that many of these bans may be unconstitutional violations of First Amendment rights. There's also been a dramatic increase in laws prohibiting sitting or lying, often based on a cry from the business community to move homeless people out of uh, downtown areas, despite a complete lack of evidence that these laws actually do anything to improve economic activity. And another area of explosive growth has been in laws banning sleeping in vehicles, again reflecting the fact that for many people, once they lose their home, their car can be their last refuge. But instead of extending help to our fellow residents who have lost their homes, communities are instead kicking them while they're down, giving them tickets that they can't pay, impounding their vehicles, which prevents them from getting to work opportunities or having a place to live, and often losing their belongings in the process. Here again, the courts have spoken with the Ninth Circuit invalidating a car camping ban in Los Angeles last year. Perhaps most egregiously, communities are also trying to indirectly make life more difficult for homeless persons by punishing even those good Samaritans who are sharing food with them, which is particularly ironic as food stamp benefits have been cut by those saying it shouldn't be a government duty, but one that should be done by charities, and now they're saying charities can't do it either. Again, we brought litigation in this area, and we've gained a successful settlement in a case in Texas we brought a few years back. Criminalization laws are popular because they allow city officials under pressure from the community to do something about homelessness to say they're doing something, even if it isn't the best thing, and in fact, may be the worst because it hides the costs. Many of these ordinances pass with the words, no fiscal impact on them, even though nothing could be further from the truth. Study after study has shown that it is actually two to three times cheaper to provide housing than it is to criminalize homelessness. But you have to appropriate the funding for housing affirmatively, whereas the costs to police, jail, and hospitals from criminalization are absorbed but never discussed by those in those budgets, making it more politically expedient. In some communities, police, sheriffs, and hospitals have been powerful advocates against criminalization for this reason. The police would rather be out on the streets fighting real crime than arresting people for simply trying to survive, and hospitals would rather see people housed than cycling in and out of their ERs. So these are, uh, in some ways, undertapped uh, allies in the fight against criminalization, and we encourage people to reach out to them. Criminalization is also costly to individuals. 40% of homeless people are working in any given month, trying to save up money to get their first and last month's rent and security deposit. When they're cited for simply trying to exist in public, they either pay that fine, setting them back in their attempts to exit homelessness, or they can't pay, which turns into a bench warrant for their arrest. Then the next time they're cited, they're carted off to jail. And in fact, we've heard of people literally on their way to a housing interview who were arrested, missing their interview, and falling back to the bottom of the voucher list because they were sitting in a jail cell. That prevented them from exiting homelessness for a whole other year. And once that arrest is on one's record, as Rob said, it makes it so much harder to get housing or employment. 
many employers won't look into whether someone was arrested for simply trying to survive. They'll just pass on to the next applicant. Beyond that, many courts impose fees for their services and then charge interest on those fees and fines when they can't be paid. So somebody with a $200 camping ticket could turn into thousands of dollars in debt that prevents them from ever restabilizing their life and exiting homelessness. In 2012, the U.S. Interagency Council Searching Out Solutions Report recognized that criminalization laws violate not only our own First, Fourth, Eighth, and Fourteenth Amendment rights, but also violate our international human rights obligations. And in August, the Department of Justice filed its brief in our Boise anti-campaign case, setting down their position that punishing people for unavoidable human conduct violates the Eighth Amendment. In fact, since 2011, Lawsuits against criminalization ordinances have received favorable decisions in 100% of cases challenging uh, food sharing restrictions, 71% of cases challenging laws restricting camping or sleeping in public, and in two-thirds of cases challenging laws restricting begging and solicitation. Moreover, in 2014 and 2015, every single international human rights body to review the U.S. commented on the criminalization of homelessness and made recommendations for its abolition. Sir Nigel Rodley, the chair of the UN Human Rights Committee and former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, who's literally seen the worst of the worst all around the world, specifically said that he was baffled by the idea that people could be without shelter and then be trimmel, treated as criminal, uh, criminals for that uh, status. And last but not least, there's the increase in consensus within the religious community, emphasized by the Pope's recent visit, that there is no excuse for our failure to provide the basic human right to housing and the human dignity that comes with that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz Osborne from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness to talk a little bit more about how this fits into the broader federal picture and some additional resources as folks are designing their applications. Thanks so much, Eric. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Osborne. I'm a Management and Program Analyst at USISDH. And um, as Eric just stated, I've been asked to discuss a criminalization question that was included in HUBNO for this year, um, as well as some helpful resources for completing the application that exists um, as a result of the work that's been happening at the federal level. Um, so, but first off, I want to just be really clear um, from the beginning that this is a National Law Center at USISDH webinar, not a HUD webinar. And um, while we hope that the information shared here will be helpful, it shouldn't be construed as HUD guidance or endorsement. Um, I'll do my best to respond to big picture questions on criminalization, but for um, specific questions of clarification about the NOFA itself, um, I'll refer you to the HUD exchange Ask a Question, um, and you'll see later on in my presentation there'll be a link to that um, important resource for COCs. So, um, okay, to get started, this year's COC program competition um, advances HUD's key policy priorities, priorities focused on advancing the administration's goals of ending homelessness, which are outlined in Opening Doors, the Federal Strategic Plan to Prevent and End Homelessness. Um, so this is a document that kind of guides a lot of the work that USICH um, and our 19 member agencies do, um, and it's set, when it was released in 2010, it set four ambitious but achievable goals. Um, the first was to prevent and end veteran homelessness by the end of 2015, um, also finish the job of ending chronic homelessness by 2017, prevent and end homelessness among families, youth, and children uh, in 2020, and finally set a path to end all types of homelessness. <clears throat> and next slide. So with that in mind, I just want to provide a little bit of background on this year's um, COC competition. It affords approximately $1.89 billion of FY 2015 funds um, uh, that are available for applicants. And it closes on, at 7.59 p.m. on November 20th. And we've heard that this is a, a very competitive application process this year. So um, I wanted to just kind of quickly review the policy priorities that I briefly mentioned before. These are the overarching themes for what HUD is trying to achieve through its NOFA, um, and HUD will award up to four points for each of these priorities. Um, and again, they're reflective of the opening doors goals that were discussed previously, and if implemented, will well advance 
um, our shared goals to end homelessness. So there are six policy priorities in this year's NOFA. They are strategic resource allocation, ending chronic homelessness, ending family homelessness, ending youth homelessness, ending veteran homelessness, and finally um, using a housing first approach. So for the purpose of this conversation, I want to focus specifically on that sixth policy priority um, because housing first is a proven method of ending all types of homelessness. It offers uh, people experiencing homelessness with immediate access to permanent affordable or supportive housing without prerequisites like participation in treatment or um, evidence of sobriety. Uh, when it's used effectively, Housing First results in the removal of barriers to entry both for programs as well as across the system. Uh, it's relevant to um, our conversation today because um, the work to reduce the criminalization of homelessness um, we believe should be seen as part of an overall Housing First orientation for the system. And this year's NOFA includes a scoring incentive to reduce the criminalization of homelessness. Um, which is why we're all here. Um, so HUD will be awarding up to two points to COCs that can demonstrate that they're implementing strategies locally to prevent the criminalization of homelessness and to um, ensure that outreach is being conducted to the individuals and families who are least likely to seek services and assistance. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a new question for the NOFA, but a number of federal agencies have been working on alternatives to criminalization for years now and have developed resources that I think um, could be useful to you all in your application processes. Um, so, for example, um, approaching homelessness from a perspective that promotes, protects, and respects human rights has been a focus of USICH. Um, at least since the release of Opening Doors in 2010, um, and that document includes a strategy to reduce the criminalization of homelessness by defining constructive approaches to address street homelessness and considering, considering incentives to urge cities to adopt these processes, um, these practices, and um, kind of in line with that strategy um, in 2012, USICH released Searching Out Solutions, which Eric had uh, mentioned previously. Um, this document offers communities ways to address alternatives to criminalization by providing three key solutions, as well as examples, as examples of specific strategies and interventions, um, and also examples of successful impl implementation of these solutions in communities across the country. So these key solutions include um, the creation of comprehensive and seamless systems of care, collaboration between law enforcement, behavioral health services, and social service providers. Um, and then the third is alternative justice system strategies. For example, that could include specialty courts, citation dismissal programs, um, holistic public defender's offices, and reentry programs. So these might all be um, things to highlight in your application process in order to um, respond to this question on criminalization of homelessness. Um, there's a lot more good information in searching out solutions. Um, in addition, um, USICH released a newsletter and blog series to explore human rights as they're related to housing. That was um, from December 2013 through January 2014. There are a number of good um, materials there that can be helpful. Um, and uh, you can see I have the links to these all included um, in this PowerPoint. And then in, finally, in August, we released um, a document called Ending Homelessness for People Living in Encampments, Advancing the Dialogue. So this document is designed to assist communities in developing an action plan that will link people experiencing homelessness with permanent housing opportunities. Um, it's important to note that it's not intended as a final statement on the best practices for addressing the housing and services needs for people living in encampments, because um, we believe there's so much more to be learned on that topic, um, but it's meant to advance community level discussions that will strengthen practices and strategies, um, and certainly um, provides um, a lot of good um, uh, thoughts on uh, anti-criminalization strategies for communities as well. Um, so there uh, are other resources. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, from agencies that can help inform your applications as well. 
Um, again, in August, as Eric mentioned, the Department of Justice filed a statement of interest brief in um, the case opposing, opposing a Boise anti-camping ordinance. Um, in its filing, Justice argues um, that making it a crime for people who are homeless to sleep in public places when there's insufficient shelter space is um, uncon un unconstitutionally punishing them for being homeless. Um, and finally, um, the Department of State reiterated its commitment to helping communities pursue alternatives to criminalization last month during its follow-up to the Universal Periodic Review. Um, to rewind briefly, um, just explain for um, those of you who haven't heard of the UPR before, it's a process by which once every four years um, the UN Human Rights Council reviews the human rights records of each of its member countries. Um, and then it, that review allows the countries to kind of showcase on a global stage the actions that they've taken to improve their access to human rights. So um, during last month's follow-up session, State expressed its commitment to helping communities pursue alternatives to criminalization um, in, a, in its response to the Human Rights Council's recommendation to, quote, amend laws that criminalize homelessness and which are not in conformity with international human rights instruments, unquote. So again, more information um, and really, I think, um, helpful uh, alternative to criminalization language is available at the links provided. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I would just conclude by saying that having worked on alternatives to criminalization um, for, for quite a while now, the USITH is pleased that the scoring incentive has been added to the note for this year. Um, I would just conclude again by highlighting this link, which is to the HUD exchange ask a question. Um, I think that this is probably um, a, a a really key resource for people who have questions about um, their NOFA applications and the competition this year. Um, this They can help with any specific questions that you might have. And thanks so much for joining our webinar today. Thank you, Liz. Um, uh, now, um, Janelle, do you know if uh, Barbara or John have been able to join yet? Barbara, John, are you there? All right, we seem to have had some technical difficulties in getting them on the line. Um, if they are able to join later, uh, we will uh, get them on for you. Um, Rob, I don't know if uh, you have any more thoughts that you would want to share at this point as a, um, you know, a member of a continuum on how uh, you might be thinking about approaching this question. Um, if you if you have some thoughts, uh, feel free to share them now, or, or I can proceed. Well, I, I think, it, and thank you, Eric. I think it's a big discussion that we have to have within our continuum. We were challenged with the NOFA coming out. I'm trying to figure out the best way for us to maximize the score. We understand HUD's um, initiatives and. We have to craft our continuum to meet those initiatives. It, it is a challenge. Um, we had a, a meeting on the NOFA last Friday that is um, that has us focused on the criminalization issue. Uh, not only the criminalization issue, but chronic homeless is a big priority in the housing first model. So those are the big priorities. But I think knowing that the competition is, is a strong one and a tough one to share, and resources are, are being reduced at the federal level, we're going to have to figure out creative ways, and this offers an opportunity for us to increase our score. Um, and as HUD does things like change around the ranking and, and list a set of priorities that don't necessarily agree with the priorities that we've used in the past. So it's keeping us on our toes as a continuum and keeping us thinking of how to move in a direction that that can maximize the score. New York is unique. Um, the amount of money that you heard released in the NOFA is about the same amount of money that is spent in New York City on the homeless issue. So we have a very complex system and money and resources coming in from a lot of different places. And we really can't afford to use. Uh, we have to make do with less. We understand that. But it offers a specific set of challenges. And I think this opportunity creates an opportunity for different levels of government to work together, also with um, justice agencies, with the courts, with police departments. I think it's going to take a, a citywide collaboration to make this, 
to get a, an effective outcome. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. Uh, as a member of the continuum, it will offer a specific set of challenges, but I think anybody listening on the phone from New York knows we've met those challenges in the past, and here comes another one. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, with that, um, I wanted to share some resources uh, that we have uh, collected from across the country, some best practices on constructive alternatives to criminalization. Uh, Miami, for example, uh, has created a small beverage tax that goes to support their housing trust fund, including Housing First initiatives. Um, and Miami just stopped their proposed anti-camping ordinance on the heels of the DOJ's showing their willingness to take a stand in our Boise case. Um, Utah has reduced its chronically homeless population by 75% over the past decade using Housing First principles and reducing its reliance on criminal justice system. Um, home, Houston has a homeless outreach team on their police force of officers who are really there to serve and protect all of the people of Houston, including their most vulnerable, bringing blankets, socks, and access to services for those who want them, rather than the threat of needless arrest. The Department of Justice ca just came out with their new 21st Century Policing Task Force report that emphasizes a guardian rather than a warrior approach, and many police departments will be talking about how to implement the recommendations of that report. So advocates should be part of those conversations with their police departments and talk about how criminalization of homelessness plays into uh, becoming you know, less warriors and more guardians. In Washington, D.C., um, every new recruiting class at the police academy receives training, uh, sensitivity training on homelessness provided by um, the Washington Legal Clinic on Homelessness, and they, um, they also have a uh, police procedure model um, that, uh, that we can offer to communities um, who are looking for uh, model practices that other um, police departments could use. Um, also in Washington, D.C., the Downtown Business Improvement District provides funding for homeless outreach and housing, understanding that this is a much better use of their tax dollars than trying to hide homelessness through criminalization. Uh, last, uh, Philadelphia's hospitals and insurers have partnered together to provide respite housing for homeless persons with medical conditions to prevent their cycling through emergency rooms at much higher costs. These and many other constructive alternatives are available in our reports and in the USICH resources that were highlighted earlier. Um, and here we have some recommendations. Um, all our steps that can be done at the local level and at the state level as well. Um, as uh, Rob mentioned before, several states have initiated homeless bills of rights that remove the incentive for communities to race to the bottom in their efforts to make their city the least hospitable to homeless people. But even in the absence of state action, local communities should immediately cease enforcement of criminalization policies and then take steps to repeal them in favor of more constructive alternatives. As continuums or advocates, you have an important voice to advocate against criminalization. For some continuums, that voice may have been muted for fear of biting the hand that feeds your funding accounts. So some tips on how you can approach your local decision makers include um, using the Department of Justice brief and the HUD funding application to uh, give you political cover, saying, look, it's not us, it's the federal government saying we shouldn't do this. Um, for communities where Housing First has started to take hold, or where the mayor may have committed to the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness, um, those give you footholds to say there's no way to achieve the goals of ending homelessness um, or you doing housing first in the right way if you are also doing criminalization. In advocating, it's important to start early. Long lawsuits are long, complicated, and never a sure bet. It's far easier to stop a criminalization ordinance from passing than it is to get rid of it once it's on the books. So start your organizing and educating early. We're happy to help, for example, by providing a letter to your elected officials outlining the legal and policy faults with proposed ordinances, but we can't do that if 
you all contact us the day before the hearing. Let us know early and we'll work with you as best we can. Second, it's important to dispel the myths around homelessness. There's lots of great information on that in our reports. Third, uh, and this may be key for many audiences, um, is showing your elected officials who are getting pressure to do something about homelessness that criminalization is the most costly, least effective approach. Our colleagues at uh, Eugene Sleeps collected the following information on a couple of residents at one of their encampments called Whoville. As you can see here, you can match up the uh, days that they spent in jail um, when they were being harassed by the police and when the encampment wasn't being allowed um, with costs of putting somebody in jail and then you can have you know, show very real figures to your local community about how much criminalization costs them. You can use public information requests and surveys of the homeless community to help generate this data. And the whole premise of this webinar is that communities could lose points towards their federal funding applications if they continue to pursue criminalization. So bring this uh, to the attention of your elected officials and of the public. Once you've established that criminalization is not the way to go, show the examples from our reports of better alternatives, um, and then organize and activize to keep the pressure on. Look for non-traditional allies, law enforcement, your local human rights commission, even the chambers of commerce or downtown business improvement districts. Each of these players has an interest in seeing homelessness ended in the most humane and cost-effective way. Uh, so coming back to why we're here, in presenting your applications to HUD, if your community isn't criminalizing, then great, tell them that. If you've done something as a continuum to educate your decision makers or the public or work with your law enforcement agencies, tell them that. If you haven't done anything yet, then tell them your plans based on what you've heard here today. Um, I believe we now have uh, Barbara and John on the line from Rhode Island um, who can talk a little bit more from a continuum of care perspective. Um, Barbara and John, are you on now? Yes, we are. Great. Um, so yeah, go ahead and, and share a little bit about what uh, what you folks have already done in Rhode Island and any thoughts you might have in terms of going forward. Well, first, we were the first state to pass a homeless bill of rights. Unfortunately, with our community, it's hard to find a person who is, um, can draw the sympathy. Most of our people have uh, police rec arrest records on, wrapped around criminalization uh, as far as they get arrested for failure to move, which isn't even a law, yet people are getting time and fines for it and it's on their record. So they come across as a bad actor with several arrests. They get arrested for panhandling. They get arrested for just doing activities of daily living, you know, eating, sleeping, uh, just being there smoking. Um, we see it all the time on outreach. Um, people, you know, if there's, there are no bathrooms available, especially at nighttime, um, so they're arrested for urinating in, in public spaces. It's, it's a really sad state of affairs when we can't, um, people can't even just do the daily stuff. And uh, we had a, a lady last night on outreach, she is in a wheelchair, and she um, stays outside all night long, and she's unable to, um, even if there was a bathroom around, she can't get up to do that. And so she ends up uh, being in front of a store, and she has to take care of her bodily functions. And um, the police are, are ready to arrest her to um, for, for those kinds of things. What we are doing, we've started discussions with the mayor in Providence. 
saying that the harassment has to end. We've already had one protest, and that opened the door to meetings with him and his staff. Um, it seems in our case, direct action is our only route, is to keep, keep it in the public eye and let public opinion change the way they do business. We have an adversarial relationship with the police at this time, as does the homeless community. The homeless community wants no police contact, so they end up making bad choices and sleeping in areas that are unsafe because they know the police won't go there. And the um, the homeless bill of rights that you guys uh, were, you know, as you said, first in the nation to pass. Um, at this point, that that hasn't helped things much. Um, is that true, or we we handed out copies to the people on the street and told them to give it to the police officer when they feel they're being discriminated against, and the police have torn them up. Hmm. So we're, we're really up against it here, and again, it, we're, we're fighting gentrification, and the downtown businessmen are basically driving the bus and trying to push all the homeless out of downtown. And we're, we're, we have a big mountain in front of us to climb to get to the other side where people will be accepted regardless of who they are. How were you able to, to pass the Homeless Bill of Rights um, in the first place, even if it hasn't been effective? Um, obviously, you must have uh, generated some, some attention and, um, and built some allies in order to do that. We, we lobbied endlessly at the State House and got people to sign on and endorse till, to the point where and again, along party lines, we, we got it passed. Unfortunately, like I said, we don't have the perfect client that we can challenge the law. And the attorneys that we're dealing with are really reluctant to put a case before the court that they might lose. They, they want a win situation right out of the box, and that will send a message everywhere else. We advocate for the shotgun effect, you know, file 20 lawsuits, and they'll get tired of defending it in court. So we're still having that discussion, and it's getting the legal community who's on our side to back us on getting somebody in court to challenge the police that they are being, you know, discriminatory in their practices to you know, put it in what's going on. We have, we're a big college town here in Providence. They will never stop a student and dump a student's bags out on a sidewalk, kick the stuff around, then tell them pack it up and get out of here. But they do it to the homeless on a daily basis. Yeah. They stop homeless people time and again, demand they present an ID, they run it for warrants then give it back to them and tell them, get out of there, actually forcing people on the buses that are taking them away from their destination, shelter with the night, of the night. So there's a lot of fear right now in the homeless community about the police, and the police have promised retaliation for anyone who stands up to them. Well, again, hopefully the... Um the federal action that's uh, that's been coming uh, down and things like this uh, funding application can serve as political cover um, for those uh, who want to stand up now. Um, uh, is there, and I should also point out for people that uh, Rhode Island's Homeless Bill of Rights um, the past is uh, just a non-discrimination uh, ordinance that says homeless people can't be discriminated against for their their status. Some of the homeless bills of rights that have been proposed are um, you specifically address, uh, you know, uh, non-enforcement of criminalization ordinances. Um, and there's more detail in that on that in um, some of our reports. 
uh, on which we have um, called From Wrongs to Rights, uh, which talks about many different models of uh, homeless bills of rights. Um, uh, Barbara and John, is there anything else you would want to share about um, the application process or, or anything else uh, before we move on? No, nope, not at this time. Okay, thanks. Um, so, Thank you. As I was, um, yeah, and if uh, it, you can stay on the line uh, for for another minute or two, but we'll be getting to questions shortly. If there's anything that uh, that you want to pipe in on? Oh, sure, um, no problem. Uh, so, all of the information that I have covered today, all of the statistics and um, uh, data, and many of the talking points. Um, can be found in our No Safe Place report and our No Safe Place Advocacy Manual, which are both available on our website at, at the address on the screen. Um, and we'll be launching a campaign next year against criminalization for the human right to housing, so stay tuned to participate in that. If you didn't answer yes uh, during the registration process for the webinar to get on our mailing list, um, feel free to go to our website and sign up for our mailing list so, so you can stay informed about that. Um, so before we wrap up, let's do a couple more questions um, and find out, uh, did, your, did this webinar improve your knowledge of what criminalization is and constructive alternatives to it? Great, it looks like uh, we've got vast majority saying yes. Um, and last but not least, uh, will you use what you learned today in your work on behalf of homeless people in your communities? Fantastic. So it looks like just about everybody saying yes. Um, so uh, if folks have any more questions, um, please don't hesitate to be in touch with us. Uh, if you thought today's webinar was useful, please consider making a donation on our website or writing us into your funding application to come and provide training or technical assistance in your community. Uh, this webinar is being recorded uh, and should be available on our YouTube page in a couple of days. If you want to share it with others, um, you should receive a link for that um, after the webinar is over. So um, uh, right now we will turn to some of the questions that folks have been e uh, putting into the chat box on the side of the screen. Um, Janelle, uh, are you there and can you uh, start sharing questions for us? Yes, absolutely. So we've received a number of great questions. We won't have time to get to all of them, but we'll um, get through as many as we can. So um, Eric, the first question I will um, share with you, are regulations requiring a permit for providing mass meals in public parks and so forth, are those considered a ban if you are required to have a permit? Um, it depends on how onerous the permitting process is. Um, in uh, in um, our Dallas case, uh, they um, they made it very onerous and, and said there would only be you know one or two permits available per organization per year. You could only have a certain number of people. All, any of those kind of regulations, um, if they make it extremely difficult in practice to actually um, perform um, the activities, can be considered um, could uh, be uh, illegal or unconstitutional restrictions. Um, there's different laws that they can be challenged under. Uh, for example, uh, if it's a religious organization, it can be challenged as a, a um, religious freedom issue. Um, it can also be challenged as a freedom of assembly issue or First Amendment issue for other groups. Um, so there are many different challenges that can be brought. 
our uh, end result, our settlement in the Dallas case, um, ended up still uh, having some regulations, um, but uh, it made it much more practical for uh, the service providers to actually be able to, to do the work um, that they do. Uh, so um, it, some regulations uh, are, are okay, but if it's something that has the effect of, uh, you know, an all but name banning the, the process, then that's, you know, those are the kinds of practices that get um, more and more close to, um, to unconstitutional or, or um, violations of some state laws. Great, thank you. So next question, do we see the criminalization of homelessness as being more prevalent in urban areas or do we have statistics showing uh, the difference between urban and rural areas? Um, so I'll take that again. Um, if uh, uh, In our reports that I mentioned on um, the previous slide uh, documents the uh, prevalence of criminalization in 187 cities uh, and towns all across the country uh, with a wide variety of shapes, sizes, geographical distribution, etc. Um, and we see them popping up uh, everywhere. Um, in urban areas where people uh, may come to seek services in suburban communities where there are no services and, and no shelters so that um, people you know, uh, have no choice but to be on the streets um, and, and as well as in rural communities. So it's really something that is occurring everywhere um, and in every case, uh, you know, it, uh, is costing communities uh, more than simply providing housing would. So it's, uh, it's a universal problem um, and the solutions uh, ending criminalization and uh, providing adequate affordable housing and adequate, um, uh, you know, rapid housing, rehousing solutions for people who have become homeless uh, are important in all of these areas. Great, thank you. So the next question, what about projects like Safe Harbor? and similar projects such as those that Robert Marbet puts forth. Are those kind of projects acceptable or how might those be reflected in this, um, this circumstance? Um, so on the one hand, uh, we certainly endorse the notion of having low barrier shelters. Um, uh, I believe some of uh, Marbet's safe harbor shelters aren't really located in areas that are conducive um, to homeless people accessing them. They're far outside of the city center with not uh, a lot of transportation um, access. So uh, they are less than ideal in that way. Um, but the, the biggest uh, th thing about those shelters is that they should be voluntary. If people want to enter them, they should be able to enter them. Um, but Marbet often pairs his approach of providing these shelters with a heavy criminalization approach. So saying people are forced to choose either you get a ticket and you go to jail or you, um, you go to a shelter. And we really feel like if the shelter is actually adequate and actually meeting people's needs, um, then you don't need the criminalization push to get them in there. Um, our colleagues at the 100,000 Homes Campaign and Community Solutions, now uh, 0 2016, have shown that um, you can do outreach to even the most shelter resistant, um, chronically homeless individuals and get them into housing. Um, if you provide a housing first approach that uh, gets them in with no barriers and then provides the wraparound services that they require, um, it may take a little bit longer to get them into housing, but that will be a permanent solution for them. Um, and the statistics have borne it out. Housing first approaches have something like a 95% retention rate. I don't think uh, any of Marbet's shelters um, have shown more than a 35% um, rate of uh, moving into permanent housing. So um, the the low barrier shelter um, is you know can be an excellent part of a uh, system of 
reducing homelessness to, to make homelessness a rare, uh, very brief and one-time occurrence, um, but there's absolutely no need to pair that with a criminalization approach um, in order to, to make it work. And in fact, providing that criminalization component to it works counter to the intent of the program because it is going to just put those further barriers between people and getting off the streets. Great. Thanks, Eric. So next question. What can communities do when the continuum of care is made up of many cities? Would all of the cities have to show HUD how they're reversing criminalization? Or how would, would those continue or approach this question? Um, Liz, I don't know if you would have any, any thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, that's um, a good question. And um, I would think um, that if there is Anything um, that any of the cities is doing to approach criminalization, I would include it. Um, but uh, again, you know, that's just kind of my best guess. So um, I would encourage you guys to reach out to the HUD um, website as well on that. And I think the um, the applica the application really talks about what is. What are the continuums doing? So, if uh, criminalization exists in all those cities, um, what would the continuum be doing to reach out to all of those cities and um, and address the issue in each one of them? Um, so, you know, public awareness events, um, letters to the editor, reaching out, uh, you know, at individual city council hearings or county boards, wherever it might be. Um, or uh, you know, direct action as, as Barbara and John were talking about before. Um, Eric, can I just offer a thought here? Please, this is Rob. So hello, folks. Um, one of the things that I think that happens in New York City is the continuum is made up of care providers, government representatives, um, and those care providers are in coalitions. There are government agencies and an uh, uh, equal number of consumers. So they're made up in equal three parts. And I think having that cross-section of participation helps to bring uh, conversations to a place where they need to be, that folks are working in unison to provide solutions. I think that's the key. You know, we are one city made up of five boroughs, um, but we have to work together. This, is, this process of getting funding from HUD is a competitive process, and you're looked upon as a continua, not as those individual cities. So internally, uh, just and it's just the best guess is that folks would have to start having conversations, maybe put together an ad hoc work group of of what are we doing and what are the processes that we're going to use in the future to to address this issue. I think that's very important. It's it's a collaboration, and it, it HUD is really looking at that collaborative effort. Fantastic, super helpful, Rob. Um, Barbara, or John, do you have any any thoughts on this? Uh, no, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, honestly, I can't agree more because we were just talking about um, cooperation, and um, it, I mean, it makes it so much easier when we can all work together instead of competing for the for the big pot. You know, for the big pot of money, we're always, um, you know, everybody wants to compete for that instead of uh, thinking about the the end result, we all want to just get people off the street, you know, and I know it sounds simple and I know it's not, but I, I just wish that it was more cooperation in, instead of all this infighting about the money. Thanks, guys. All right. Um you know, I guess we can take the, the next question. Sure. So next question. How can providers and advocates get city governments to repeal laws that are already in place that criminalize homeless people and also criminalize those who try to help them? Huh. It's, a, it's a good question. I think, um, you know, some of the, the steps that I shared before in terms of, um, you know, 
collecting information, showing the impact of criminalization in your community. Um, the Western Regional Advocacy Project, RAP, that uh, Rob mentioned earlier, has a survey uh, that they have available. It's, uh, if you go to raphome.org, um, you can find uh, under their criminalization materials um, or homeless bill of rights materials um, a survey that you can do with uh, homeless people in your community um, and collect some data and show uh, the impact, you know, how many people have been arrested, how many people have been cited under these laws. Um, and then, as I said before, you can match that up with um, some of the cost data. How many days have they spent in jail? What's the average cost of a, a night in jail in, in your town? And start bringing out the real cost of criminalization in your community. Um, you can work with your local human rights commission. Um, uh, these are bodies in many cities and towns that um, talk about human rights issues at the local level. Uh, the National Association of Human Rights Agencies actually passed a resolution a few years ago uh, condemning criminalization of homelessness and promoting homeless bills of rights as an alternative. Um, and so they can be brought on board as allies or quasi-governmental agencies. They may be able to uh, connect you to other people in government who could be allies on these issues. Um, and then, as I said, I think you, you're you talking about the the other costs, um, the potential costs uh, for continuums if uh, com uh, communities continue to engage in criminalization, um, to, you know, to the federal funding that they might be uh, able to access as well as um, the potential cost of litigation. We know that the Department of Justice has said they are willing to intervene in these cases. Um, and uh, with a number of the precedents that have come down recently, um, we think that criminalization is a, uh, a losing option in, in court. Uh, so um, you know, it, if you bring the, all of these things to the attention of elected officials, um, you know, direct action, sleep in in public parks, uh, emphasizing that, you know, uh, these are our fellow community members, um, uh, you know, that can be, can be powerful. Bringing on the non-traditional allies, you know, making your case to the business community um, or to the police departments directly and then bringing them on as allies um, uh, can also be effective. I know that in Walla Walla, Washington, for example, a, a smaller town, um, but one that's growing with their new kind of winery um, activity. Um, they uh, had a, a push from the Downtown Business Alliance towards criminalization um, because of uh, homeless people who were in the, the local public park in front of uh, some of their businesses. Uh, but they actually took the step to do a survey of who was out there and found out that unlike their uh, stereotypes, um, they thought that these were mostly transient people from outside of town who were coming and making a nuisance of themselves. Um, instead, they found out that these, for the most part, were people from the community um, who had simply lost their jobs, had some sort of uh, medical emergency, or a, you know their car broke down and they had to pay that, and then they lost their housing, um, you know, any of these things, you know, they found, they rehumanized the homeless population and said, rather than just, you know, homeless transients, these are our fellow community members and they, um, you know, we as a community have failed them and so it's up to us to, to do something uh, to help them. And so, you know, having done that survey, having gained that information, um, they have now created the political will uh, to reduce their use of criminalization approaches to um, encourage the police to adopt a much uh, um, more, you know, see if we can get you into services kind of approach um, and are now looking at sites for a day shelter. You know, they've determined that the, the reason people are hanging out in the park is they need somewhere to be, they need somewhere to charge their cell phones, um, you know, those kinds of things. They need to have access to public bathrooms. You know, if you can meet those needs in other ways, um, then you can address both the, the very real needs of homeless people as well as the needs of the business community. And so they were able to generate the, the will to do that um, you know, through their survey work and then 
um, move it into action. So you know, those are just some tips. Um, I don't know if anybody else has has any responses to that kind of a question. Eric, this is Rob. I'd just love to follow up. I, I think you, you laid out some great guidelines. Folks, uh, one of the reasons why I entered this work after coming out of shelter, I worked in IT for a number of years before I went homeless, but we, we spent a lot of energy in this country painting a picture of who the homeless person is. And to my understanding, as I was exiting shelter, as a homeless person was uneducated, no work history, uh, diagnosed with uh, certain mental illnesses, chemical addiction, alcoholism. Well, I became homeless after a 30-year work history with a college degree, never diagnosed with mental illness, never had a chemical addiction. So we need to understand, we need to make those efforts to understand who these folks are. And I think the survey is a great way to do it. I worked with the Western Regional Advocacy Project on some of the surveys here on the East Coast, and it's in a very effective tool of understanding who the people are and what is happening to them. So. Uh, again, you know, it, it's not only us in one area, it's folks around the country collaborating and sharing strategies. And I'll just follow up on that order. I'd love to have a conversation with Barbara and John around statistics and, and tact, uh, on strategy and tactics um, that could possibly use in Providence because I'm very familiar with the tent city that existed along the river. I visited there in 2008, got to meet a lot of the residents and understand what is going on in the city. Um, and I don't think much has changed based on the conversations I've had with folks. So it would be good for me to reconnect with you guys and some of the folks up there. May I jump in there? This is John. Please. Yeah, one thing we've done, we, we have a program called Speakers Bureau and it's homeless and formerly homeless go out and talk to schools and church organizations and the faith-based community far more than any other sector has come on board and supported our efforts in direct actions and pressuring the legislators and, and the politicians and it's it's broad-based, so it's all faith, so we touch on everybody. And it's really been effective in getting the attention, and that was one of the keys to getting Homeless Bill of Rights passed, was getting them on board and getting up them up there at the State House and, and pushing for this bill to pass. Great. Thank you. <coughs> All right, so I'll move on to the next question. Um, how can advocates use the Department of Justice's recent statement of interest brief in the Bell versus Boise case in local advocacy? Um, well, I think you know they when they put out uh, the um, the statement of interest brief. Um, not only did they file it in our case, but they filed it with a press release um, and. It went out, it got a lot of attention um, in the press nationally. Um, the Washington Post even wrote an editorial, um, you know, uh, endorsing the, the notion that criminalization is wrong. Uh, the uh, New York Times did an editorial a few weeks later um, uh, in the context of some of Bill de Blasio's new plans, um, but also uh, encouraging housing and discouraging a criminalization approach. Um, so I think it's a great tool to use with the, the press, you know, to say that uh, this is the kind of law, you know, that is being challenged in Boise is also um, present in our community. And, uh, you know, uh, if it's challenged, it could be a costing lawsuit for the city. And rather than spending those resources uh, defending an inhumane law, why don't we work now to... Uh, you know, reverse it uh, to and to do something that is going to actually, you know, rather than um, spending those resources to uh, to defend this lawsuit, why don't we use them to actually um, put people into housing and actually solve the problem? Um, so I think that um, you know communities can, if you can engage some uh, legal assistance, pro bono legal assistance at the local level. Um, or you can reach out to the Law Center and we may be able to, to connect you to pro bono resources. Um, you know, you can write a letter uh, you know, conduct, doing an analysis of 
your local law um, under the uh, Department of Justice uh, analysis um, and uh, say, you know, this is um, this is uh, how we would see this, you know, this law losing in court. And if you uh, would want to avoid that, then why not uh, repeal it now and replace it um, with with some housing resources or or something else that's more uh, going to you know address the the situation in a positive way. You can also file complaints directly with the Department of Justice. Um, if you reach out to their special litigation section, um, you can submit by email or by fax or, or call them on the phone. Um, you know, uh, we will be hopefully putting together some resources for um, communities uh, in the near future to help them prepare uh, those kinds of complaints. Um, but if you just kind of collect the information, how many homeless people are there in your community? How many uh, shelter beds are there? How many um, uh, you know, are there more shelter, more homeless people than shelter beds? What ordinances are they being criminalized under? Um, if you've done any kinds of the surveys, like um, uh, the uh, RAP surveys, then um, you can include that kind of data as well. Um, and you know that uh, that could serve as the basis for a complaint, and then maybe you can get the, the Department of Justice. Uh, interested in your area as well, so um, you know, or use the the threat of filing that complaint with your um, with your elected officials as a step to get them to come to the table and and start a conversation with you. Um, so I think there's uh, you know the, the Department of Justice has firmly set down its opinion in this case, um, and uh, they you know uh, they've shown their willingness. Uh, to bring this issue in, in enforcement in the courts, um, and so that that should be a lesson for for other cities as well. Um, if, are there um, any more questions at this point, Janelle, or um, should we be wrapping up? Well, I'll I'll give you one final question then, Eric. Um, what are some advocacy strategies that can be used to satisfy both the needs of um, individuals experiencing homelessness and also the business community, which is all, all, often pushing um, you know, just as hard on local city governments to sometimes pass criminalization ordinances. I think uh, really showing the, um, the cost data is going to probably be your most effective tool um, in talking to the business community, but emphasizing that it's their tax dollars that are being used and used poorly, used in a way that costs their, you know, the community, um, as I said, two to three times as much um, than providing housing. And at the end of the day, um, you know, the the um, have they seen any reduction in homelessness as a result of using the criminalization ordinances that they've been pushing? Um, in San Francisco, there was a, a fantastic survey that was done um, by uh, the Coalition on Homelessness in, in San Francisco um, that shows that thousands and thousands of tickets have been given out um, to uh, homeless people uh, living there, and you know there's been no reduction in homelessness. It doesn't encourage people to go elsewhere. Um, it doesn't um, uh, solve the problem of homelessness. It just you know makes that homeless person have a, a fine that they can't possibly pay um, and then that's a further barrier to them getting out of homelessness. Um, in the city of Los Angeles they recently declared a, a homeless emergency because the problem of homelessness has, has gotten so large there. Uh, they've been spending a hundred million dollars a year on dealing with homelessness but of that hundred million only thirteen million have been for services the vast majority of that, 87 million of that, has been to policing, but their policing budget, um, and in fact, six million of it uh, goes to the Safer Cities Initiative, the so-called Safer Cities Initiative, um, which has been um, used almost exclusively to uh, uh, harass homeless people in the Skid Row area, um, and so it's uh, just a. a with that 87 million dollars over the past, you know, however many years that they've been spending it, 
Um, they could have been incentivizing the development of affordable housing. They could have been um, building and providing uh, housing first options and, and um, permanent supportive housing for people. Um, this is a problem. Um, you know, I think that we have to emphasize in our messaging that um, as much personal responsibility as any homeless person may have for their circumstances, um, it's even more a failure of our collective responsibility um, to our communities that um, we have failed for year after year to prioritize the development of affordable housing. Um, in Los Angeles, for example, 90% uh, of the housing that was produced um, this year, past year and for many years before that has been only affordable to the top 10% of the population. And that is a direct result of city policies that encourage the development of that unaffordable housing at the expense of everybody else in their community who now has to compete for very limited numbers of affordable housing spots, putting many people just one missed paycheck, one broken down car, one medical emergency away from homelessness themselves. Um, and so that's going to continue to feed into um, the homelessness problem. And once somebody becomes homeless, it's far more expensive to help them get out of homelessness than it would have been to prevent it in the first place. So these are choices that communities have made, and we need to help them make better choices um, it may take a year or two. Homelessness on this scale was not created in a day, and it won't be ended in a day. But it, you know, certainly won't be ended if we keep pursuing um, the same misguided policies that have gotten us into this um, mess in the first place. Um, and you know, it's the the definition of insanity to keep doing the same thing um, and uh, and expecting a different result. Um, so we've tried criminalization. We know that it doesn't work. There's study after study after study that shows that it is much more cost effective to uh, provide housing. This is uh, uh, um, uh, it's working in very red states like Utah, um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, just uh, did a nice study with their new permanent uh, supportive housing complex that showed that it is saving their community um, about two million dollars a year. Um, so. As these uh, cost studies continue to come out, I think we can continue to push that with the business community um, and bring them on board as allies if, if there are op people who are open to that. Um, and again, it was the, the downtown business improvement district uh, in Walla Walla, Washington, that actually conducted the survey. So if you can convince just uh, you know a few people to, to have an open mind to find out you know uh, who the homeless people are on the streets and then use that to help change the conversation. Um, I think that's, you know, those are the, the steps that we can start taking. Eric, this is Liz at USICH. Um, that was an excellent wrap-up, and I hate to jump in because um, it seemed like a great, great place to end, but just wanted to highlight on the, um, on the business owner's question, the encampment document that USICH has on our website um, talks about the four key elements for action plans for communities. And one of those elements is collaboration, and it states that um, basically any plan should include collaboration between a cross-section of public and private agencies, neighbors, and business owners. Um, so I think kind of um, using the concepts and tactics that Eric just discussed to um, forge strong relationships with this broad range of, um, of providers and, um, and permanent housing resources and um, and uh, local businesses can really um, help um, convince um, the local government and other key stakeholder stakeholders to um, come up with alternatives to criminalization. So that's available in the encampment document. And, and we should also point out um, that uh, uh, U the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness has regional coordinators who are able to um, help make connections for people, um, you know, help governments talk to peer governments, um, maybe help, uh, you know, a business improvement district or a chamber of commerce talk to another one. So um, those uh, regional coordinators are on the USICH website, um, and they're, they're a great resource for communities to draw on um, as they, they continue to do this work. Absolutely. Uh, yep. <clears throat> 
So with that, um, if uh, Rob or uh, John or Barbara, do you have any last comments? Uh, I think we're good. All right. So this is Rob. I just I appreciate everybody taking the time for their busy schedules to um, participate in the webinar, particularly folks in New York who won this call. We've gone through some struggles and some challenges trying to figure out how to continue to on our track to end homelessness veteran homelessness. If Julie Irwin or Allison Zickman are in the back, we have a lot to learn from that focus that they took on from the federal government and veteran homelessness. And if we can do it for veterans, we can do it for the general population. I think, you know, I'm just encouraging folks to keep at it. It's a challenge. It's not easy. But as Liz said, and it's something that's certainly been my message through the school, it's going to take a collaborative effort. We're going to have to work together. And, you know, we're going to have to put aside our differences to make this happen. So I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, everybody. Again, um, the webinar, uh, if uh, all goes well with technology, should be um, recorded and available on our YouTube site in the coming days. Uh, we will try and send out a link to that. Um, all of the statistics and other materials um, are available on our website and um, on USICH's website. Uh, and if people have any questions, uh, certainly feel free uh, to reach out to us. Uh, directly. So thanks and, once again. Um, Eric, Eric, I do apologize that my technology was not working so well. <laughs> so I'm sorry that we were late in coming into it. Yeah, no problem whatsoever, Barbara. We, we got everything out, I think. Uh, um, and so I hope uh, people enjoyed the webinar and um, we will look forward to being in touch and working with communities to help end the criminalization of homelessness.